In the early 19th century, Britain was the most powerful nation on Earth. Her colonies stretched from the Caribbean to the South Pacific. This was the largest empire the world had ever seen. But there is a lost chapter to that imperial history, the story of over a million people who were secretly enslaved and transported to the farthest shores of the British Empire. Shipped under agreements that they could neither read nor understand, they didn't know where they were going, and most of them never made it home. Yet what was one of the largest movements of people in the 19th century has now been almost completely forgotten. It is a story of greed, injustice and the abuse of power. A story which implicates those at the very highest level of successive British governments. Indentured emigration is one of the most remarkable episodes in modern history. The systematic recruitment and migration of over one million people to all the corners of the globe. Indians are one of the most dispersed groups on this planet. And have you ever stopped to think why Indians are found in these far-flung places? For hundreds of thousands of men, women and children, this was not just a voyage into the unknown. It was a life sentence. When you take the system of coercion, the system of the lack of justice, the meagerness of people's existence, and the fact that they were just there to work to make money for the, for the planter class, then you can see why indentureship was called a new system of slavery. By the 1830s, Britain's empire was growing at a phenomenal rate. Crops such as tea, coffee, cotton and sugar had become staple products for an increasingly prosperous population. But the new and hungry machinery required an endless supply of raw material and the furnaces of progress were fueled by slave labour. And while the empire was reaching its peak, it was also facing its greatest crisis. Liberals were demanding reform of the slave trade, beginning the process that would lead to the abolition of slavery. Of justice, humanity and sound policy. In less than five years, Britain's plantation owners would lose their African slaves forever. The British liked to preen themselves on the morality of this decision that between 1833, 1838, they end a system that they had in fact perfected and that had seen the shipping of millions of Africans across the Atlantic. For all kinds of complicated reasons, the British turned their back on that in the 1830s, mainly economic, partly theological, partly political, but they turned their back on it. They decide they don't need it. But that leaves them with a problem because the great economic system that they put in place on the back of slavery, and that is sugar, primarily sugar, though other commodities as well, had to be produced by someone. Indians seem to fit the bill. India might actually be a kind of replacement for Africa. India and Indians might actually provide an answer to the labor void that had opened up in the old slave colonies. Whitehall's answer came in 1836. Publicly committed to spending millions dismantling the slave trade, the government secretly colluded in the creation of a new system of slavery. It was called indentured labor. Indentured labor is a man or woman putting a mark on a document, a legal document, signing away their freedom to a particular employer for the duration specified by the indenture, five, seven, ten years, whatever. You're no longer a free man. To trade in human lives so soon after the abolition of slavery required high-level contacts. But the man behind the plan was John Gladstone, a former member of parliament, and father of the future British Prime Minister. He began by writing to one of his former colleagues in the slave trade. You will probably be aware that we are very particularly situated with our Negro apprentices in the West Indies, and that it is a matter of doubt and uncertainty how far they may be induced 
to continue their services on the plantations after their apprenticeship expires in 1840. In May 1836, Gladstone received the reply he was hoping for. Dear Mr. Gladstone, we thank you for your inquiry. Within the last two years, upwards of 2,000 natives have been sent from this to the Mauritius. The Dangas are always spoken of as more akin to the monkey than the man. They have no religion, no education, and in their present state, no wants beyond eating, drinking, and sleeping, and to procure which, they're willing to labor. We're not aware that any greater difficulty would present itself in sending men to the West Indies, the natives being perfectly ignorant of the place they agree to go to and the length of voyage they're undertaking. Gladstone was delighted and a deal was struck. The first ships left the port of Calcutta in April 1838, carrying a human cargo of some 400 Indians. They were called the Gladstone Coolies after the Anglo-Indian word for manual laborer. These coolies would be making the longest journey of their lives, a voyage that would end on the sugar plantations of South America. In Gladstone's day, the remote colony of British Guyana produced the best sugar in the world, and the coastal plantations there had become a household name. Demerara. My name is David Dapper Eden. Even though the name means very little to me, I know very little about the name. I teach literature at a university in Britain, the University of Warwick. And I've come to Guyana to look for the origins of my great-great-grandfather, who came from India in the 19th century, one of hundreds of thousands of people who went overseas to cut cane in the plantations. He's been totally lost in history. And I just want to discover something about this bareback, barefooted coolie who stepped off the planks, stepped off the Englishman's boat, and ended up on these shores. I've been told that in our national archives, there are various lists of Indians in the plantation, birth certificates, etc. So I will just go through those as um, diligently as I can to try to trace this man. It'll be a needle in a haystack job, I suspect. I was looking for the first Abdin who came in 1855, yeah. and I don't know, I don't know the date, you see. So I was hoping to find the date. I know the name of the ship. My mother told me it was the Apolline. If I look at June 1855, would it be later than June 1855? Uh, you don't think this, this uh, would be it? No, our registers would have the details, but our ship records don't go back to 55. Where um, are the records? Do they exist? No, uh -huh. um, I don't think so. My best bet is at the PRO, though. In, in London? Yes. No. And then there are scattered, um, you know, in various offices as well. So that even if the records did exist, we wouldn't really necessarily know what location in Guyana, yeah, exactly. or indeed in England, they exist. Or even in villages throughout India, the British kept meticulous records as the Indians were recruited, gathered into holding depots, and registered. There would have been, in all likelihood, ordinary peasant Indians. They would never, ever, ever have come across the sophistication of the British Empire the bureaucratic sophistication of it until they went to the depot to be certified as fit and healthy emigrants and to be, um, to be validated by the British as potential emigrants. Certified that we have examined and passed the above named woman as fit to emigrate, that she is free from all bodily and mental disease and that she has been vaccinated since engaging to emigrate. There must have been a great moment of drama when they were asked to sign this piece of paper and, and having to press their thumb into the ink and, and, and press it on this piece of paper. Their first contact with paper probably. 
there must have been some kind of excitement, perhaps, despair, but at least somebody's paying attention to them to take their finger and press it on a piece of paper. They would not have understood what pressing, of, pressing their thumbs on a piece of paper meant because um, they wouldn't have known that that was the equivalent of a signature. This piece of paper is all that remains of the life of this woman. And she's won just hundreds in this book, band book, hundreds, men, women, children. And this volume is one volume among 358, I believe, in this building alone. So you get a sense of how many Indians came. We know that about 239,000 people came from India to Guyana alone, never mind to Jamaica, to Barbados, the rest of the West Indies. For a long time, the history of indenture was seen as a site of embarrassing history. People were reluctant to confront the truth of their past. Historian Bridge Lal is also investigating his family's past. My grandfather was an indentured laborer. He came from the district of Bahraich. He was in his early 20s and he told me that you know he was roaming around in the village and one day a man took him aside and said would you like to earn some money and my grandfather a young man without employment said yes and he took him to a, to a depot and there my grandfather encountered other men and some women who were also recruited by the same Arkati recruiter and there he learned about going overseas and you'd become a wealthy man from this tiny depot in the village he and, and other people who had been recruited were taken to Lucknow and from there they're taken to a larger depot in a district called Faisabad and from there he, he went to um, Calcutta Like all of these people, he had no idea precisely where he was going. Uh, it was a tapu, an island, but that was about all that he knew. So he said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this tapu, and, and it's not too far away, and I'll come back after, after five years or ten years. He didn't intend to leave his homeland for good. It was a traumatic experience to live in this confined you know, spaces on the ships with people who spoke uh, dialects they did not understand, people from different castes, religions, social background, and this terrible long voyage, the traumatic three-month journey across the dark seas, the Kalapani, traumatized the people, many of whom had never seen water before. Mortality aboard the coolie ships was appalling. During the voyage of Juan, the Sol set, the captain's log recorded that over a third of the Indians died en route. March 26th, a little orphan girl, four years of age, died in a state of great imprisonment. Three coolies died. A man, a fine girl, 18, who attended the little orphan boy. A little boy of 12, 27. A fine little baby has died. This mortality is dreadful and without any means of being checked. A great reformation is required in the system of coolie emigration. May 2nd, one of the twins. By 1840, over 20,000 Indians had made the long ocean crossing to South America. After a voyage of three months and some nine and a half thousand miles, the Indians finally landed in Demerara. The 
this is where they arrived. They'll face this way and they're stepping ashore, so all this would have been land, it would have been fairly um, wild land, wouldn't it? Forests and, Mango you know, swamp. but still the excitement of landing. But you know, they, they would have stepped back to have one last look. And when you look, you see nothing. The ocean just stretches endlessly. You can't see India. Whatever the hazards of the journey, it must have been a moment of great excitement. Um, these simple peasants, some of whom might have never seen um, water before, landing here, landing on a new continent. Curious spectators would have gathered to see these coolies, the first Indian coolies from uh, the subcontinent. They would have been numbered in batches and properly regimented. They were deloused, they were made presentable for the inspection of the planters. Upstairs, they met labor officers, and downstairs, they met the immigration officers. So they came, they were cleaned up, they were given a bath, they were registered, they were contracted formally. Having survived the long ocean voyage, their ordeal was only just beginning. These Indians didn't know it, but they would replace the African slaves that Britain had so recently lost. The vast majority would never see India again, and would end their lives working in cane fields on the other side of the world. Slavery had been renamed and reinvented. It's an extraordinary phenomenon that you're shipping people out of Calcutta and shipping them all the way to the Americas to produce a commodity, sugar, which the West and anyone could do without perfectly well, but which, uh, in fact, people have become completely addicted to. It's this great driving force of sugar and sweet taste in the Western world, which needs labor of some kind, slave labor, indentured labor, whatever, to produce it. Whitehall, 1840. And Gladstone's experiment in South America began to be questioned as reports of appalling mortality on the plantations filtered back to London. The transportation of Indians was debated in Parliament, forcing the Foreign Secretary, Lord John Russell, to make his doubts public. I am not prepared to encounter the responsibility of a measure which may lead to a dreadful loss of life on the one hand are on the other to a new system of slavery. But the influence of the planters on Parliament was too strong. Lord John Russell found himself outvoted and the floodgates were opened. Over the next 80 years, Indians would be transported to every corner of the empire. Planters had always had, throughout the 18th century, a powerful political hold in Westminster. The Caribbean was the, became the great jewel in the British um, crown. I mean, this was the, the great center of British wealth. I mean, India too, of course, but in terms of political power in London, planters, the plantocracy, the West India lobby that represented both planters and West India merchants and shippers, they could bend the ear of politicians and statesmen. It's in the planters' interest to continue indenture because they need the labor. Think of this from the planters' point of view. They live in their own particular culture where they need outside labor. First of all, Africans, later indentured Indian labor. They're trapped by this system as much as other people. They can't imagine a world that would deny them a source of labor, cheap, malleable labor. Their whole economic enterprise would collapse without it. So the planters need to continue in the 19th century indentured labor, much as in the 18th century, they couldn't have ever have imagined life without the slaves. India was now the empire's main source of cheap, expendable labor, and sugar production had spread to every corner of the globe. In 1874, the Fiji Islands became a crown colony. The planters turned to India to supply the manpower, and soon ships loaded with Indians began the long voyage to the South Pacific. This 
is Fiji, picturesque and prosperous, contented and industrious. Tropical islands with a fascinating mixture of the old and the new. An outpost of empire at the crossroads of the Pacific. When people think of Fiji, I suppose they think of a tropical paradise. But a paradise haunted by a terrible past. This is where our history begins. My grandfather came as an indentured laborer to this place, and this is where he served his indenture. So for about three generations, sugar has been in our blood. Bridge Lal is visiting the family home in Fiji. This is my place. This is the place of my childhood. We didn't have structures like this. We had thatched houses. And in fact, it was in a thatched hut right here uh, that I was born. This is where my grandfather's journey ended. I remember him telling me that the most difficult thing for him in the early, early days was getting used to living in congested lines and having as his companions people from different parts of India, different social backgrounds, different customs, different rituals and ceremonies and sometimes even speaking different dialects. The coolies lived in tin shacks. They were called lines and built in long rows beside the plantation. A single room, 10 feet by 12 feet, housed three single men or one man and his entire family. Diseases including cholera, malaria and typhoid regularly wiped out hundreds of Indians at a time. Bridge is going to meet one of a handful of survivors. Ram Ram. Ram. the Indians move into the old cabins, the old living places of uh, the former slaves, or they're provided with similar in a similar location. I mean, one particular plantation that I know in the middle of Jamaica to this day has on the edge of its sugar fields an area called India. And it's where they located the first uh, Indian indentured laborers. Conditions worldwide were as poor as they had been in the slave days. In Guyana, David Dabadine has managed to trace the very last surviving witness. I'm going to see somebody who I've been told was born into that condition of servitude, was born into indentorship. An elderly lady, I think she's now in her 90s. You were born in India? Me born in India and grow Guyana. Three here old me company. Three. Three here old. Me never been done three here. But your, your father worked in uh, cutting cane? Yes, me father been a cut cane, Guyana. Me and I been a bunk with for no bread. Doing what? Working in cane field? Cane field here now. We roll the trash and put them on the bank. You roll the trash and put them on the bank and you take a hole and you dig a dot and they block. The man has taken them and you wrap them and you go through the pond. Me go 
to the yard, we go to the house. To do what? You go see now what takes place in there. Oh, you could just go in? Go in. As a child? I uh have -huh, a child. Uh, what do you see? What do you see? Well, me only see the white man, you know, trying to get away back to your house. <laughs> so you look at white man, you peep, and then you go back home? Come back to your place. Uh, what, what white man doing when you peep? What, what, what was he doing? Nah, nah, do not me. As Indian men, women and children toiled in the fields, their colonial masters lived in the very height of luxury. It is the closest to paradise that you can get to be a planter. I mean, as a Hindu, I hope I come back as a 19th century planter. You lived in terrific affluence. You lived in a big white house, sometimes on a level above the cane field. So you can sit in your veranda and sip your lemonade and be fanned by your servant and have your toenails cut at the same time by some coolie and you could watch at your laborers working. You know, you could sleep with any woman you wanted to, more or less. Yes. Um, everything was done for you from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. Uh, people looked after you, people obeyed you, people were afraid of you. Your single word as a plantation owner um, could deny life. The men that had once cracked the whip over the slave gangs heading for the slave fields now do much the same over Indian indentured labour, heading to do precisely the same work in the same fields, at the same regime, producing the same commodities for the same markets. This is an overseer's house, a Columbus house, and it, as you can see, it is situated on a hill and for a very good reason because the overseer would get a very good view of, of the fields under his, under his charge and here he would, the overseer would stand and survey the field and get a good view of the work that was being done. So he was in, in a commanding position both literally as well as metaphorically. He would think for them, he was a seer, he was wise on their behalf. They just had to cut the cane and obey him. So that term overseer, which is a very paternalistic and patronizing term, was still kept for the, in the days of indentureship. But worst of all was the term driver. Do you know how that term is pregnant with terror? The memory of terror? Because really what it meant in the days of slavery is that you were driven with a whip. You were driven to work. And many of them viewed the, the laborers not as human beings but as but as, as as units of work to be to be exploited we know that in the 19th century planters would shoot people beat them shoot them and nobody would arrest them you know so you're in a position of utter power and authority but the worst of all was the arrogance you would have you know you you would know that you were supreme of a supreme civilization you were high up the food chain. <laughs> you ate first and you ate best. And so therefore, uh, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were elevated in all ways above the coolies. And your authority and your arrogance depended on their, their um, scrubbing and, and, and grubbing in, in, in the cane field. Me here said, white man, I shoot. I not go this way. I not go that way. So, me be like to know friends with them, they can have can, 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 peep around, watch around, cut me time. So you hide, if you hear a white man shooting there, you, you hide? Hide, you hide. So I just get away from my house, and, and then uh, the clock, we just make one chain, push past in here, to make one padlock, to padlock Pad the door. Yeah. So the, I just peep by the hole. Oh, look, the government come in, eh? बहुत दुख तकलीफ काटे के पड़ा अरे हम गोरा लोग लाश से मारे इसे अच्छा हाँ गोरा लोग लाश से मारे काम नहीं करो चाबुक लगा रहे गाड़ी पर हाँ कोई सुनवाई नहीं हाँ गिरमिट तुम्हारे गिरमिट तुम्हारे 
The Indians were officially citizens of the empire, but even in cases of violent abuse, the legal system was stacked against them. In practice, it was extremely difficult for an indentured laborer to succeed in a case against his or her employer, partly because the courthouses were far away and the regulations provided that you could not leave your plantations without the permission of the manager. You could be punished. You could be fined. Your contracts extended. But even when you went, went to court, evidence, written evidence, was always on the side of the employer. I mean, you get a sense of how terrible the situation was. In 1906, for example, 62% of all babies died. Made worse by the fact that the system blamed the mothers because overseers said, the government said, that these Indian women lacked motherly instincts. It was not the lack of motherly instincts. It was the relentless pace of work on plantations, the insanitary conditions where these people lived. It was the system itself that was responsible. And six of them dead. Six of them dead. Big, big one. Belly walk, belly walk, belly walk, belly walk, belly walk. Belly walk make me work. Me, me, me not know how I to tell you. Me do too much remedy for them. One, me gave one kind of sick I food, and yeah, to make it there. Me walk, me and me old man walk from this dam, for Ketil at Wal. And I've got to that box to get one remedy. One bush medicine. Who bring up my time for them. The one green that and that. Give me an eat. They come. So everybody dead out. And you left. Me left. Me don't know what me go face it. Me don't know what me go pass through it. The method of God. My big God. Night and day. The God where you send me in this world, I do no mother, I do no father. I grow with them very well, but I do no goodness for them. And you take them from me. And now I do no know what me they go turn to me. So much thing is that. More than 150 years have passed since the export of the Indians began. Many of the records have been lost or destroyed, and David's time is running out. His last chance to trace his great-grandfather is at the old post office, where a neglected pile of volumes lie exposed to the elements. I believe that people don't want to remember the past. It's a past of shame. It's not something they want to preserve in a way that in England you would preserve castles and Arthurian legends. I just wish we could have a greater care for these ancient materials and have a greater sense of their value, you know, not just their commercial value. Obviously, they have no commercial value. The coolies used to have commercial value, but their records, the records of their presence, are obviously worthless. I just wish we had a little bit more care and consideration for the ancient documents. I don't think it takes too much money to actually put these things, take, take them away from the window and the breeze and the cockroaches, and just lock them up in a vault somewhere. Well, it's a scrap. It might be somebody was born, somebody who's died, but whatever it is, they're lying on the floor. It just tells you about the difficulty of keeping records in a tropical country. This looks as if it's somebody, Demerara, there's no name, 31st of March, Anomba 451. I mean, look at all those scraps over there. Somebody's blown in my direction. Somebody called Trevor Michael has just blown in through the window. So this is Trevor Michael. Shaped like India, in fact. Under the system of indenture, Indians had been transported to every part of the empire. South America, Mauritius, Ceylon, 
Burma, Malaya, and the South Pacific. But the system was about to face its greatest challenge as a new part of the world began importing Indians by the shipload. Africa, the dark continent. Years ago, fierce wars were waged and the prisoners that were taken were used as slaves. After the coming of the white men, slavery was abolished and slave trails were replaced by iron rails. The Indian coolies were no longer confined to the sugar plantations. In South Africa, the growing railway network required cheap manual labor to continue blazing its trail across the African plains. The train crawling across the vast African countryside looks like a tiny insect. By the dawn of the 20th century, over 100,000 Indians were working for the British in Africa, on the railways and in the cane fields and the mines. But the status of Indians within the empire was about to change. In 1893, a young Indian lawyer arrived in Durban and set up his first legal practice. Over the next 20 years, this young man would change drastically from a middle-class lawyer to an extraordinary political leader. His name was Gandhi. Gandhi got to know about indentured laborers very soon after arriving here. His first major contact with an indentured worker was in 1894. The man was beaten by his employer and had his front two teeth smashed and uh, the man was in terrible distress and came into Gandhi's legal offices. This encounter would mark a turning point in the young lawyer's life. Gandhi began his campaign against indentured labor by exposing the plight of the Indians at public meetings. But he quickly realized that the future lay in unifying the isolated Indian community. The result was the first Indian newspaper in Africa. Indian opinion begins to chronicle the conditions that indentured workers lived under and the poor housing conditions, the poor food that they had, the treatment by employers. It, it is a rich chronicle of grievances. Gandhi's newspaper exposed the realities of indentured labor worldwide, but the written word was not his only weapon. It was meant that this paper would reach British India, it would reach authorities in England, but it changed to become a paper of mobilizing people. It begins to take a very important role in motivating people to go to jail. So it becomes a paper which says jail is an honorable place to be when the laws are unjust. The method Gandhi pioneered to end indentured labor became known as passive resistance. A sustained campaign of non-violent protest based on the principle of civil disobedience. It was the first time this technique had ever been used and it would bring the young lawyer into direct conflict with the British legal system. Gandhi and many of his followers ended up serving jail sentences at the prison fort in Johannesburg. His first imprisonment occurs in January 1908 and Gandhi realizes that in order to seek change one needs to go into prison to protest these laws and by one's imprisonment to make the grievance come to the attention of the authorities and to secure its removal. If you think of the people who are coming to jail, the majority of them were traders and hawkers and Many of them were fairly respectable middle-class traders, come from, you know, comfortable uh, lifestyles. Mm. And to suffer humiliation in the prisons is very difficult for a lot of them. Johannesburg, 1908. The struggle to end indentured labor was building into a national crisis. Indian merchants, laborers, and their families willingly went to prison in an effort to bring the system down. Within months, Gandhi and his followers had filled the jails of South Africa to capacity. Over the next five years, 
Gandhi would be imprisoned on four separate occasions. But going to jail was only the beginning of Gandhi's revolutionary strategy. Even from his prison cell, he used his newspaper to keep up pressure on the authorities. I shall have no opportunity of writing for Indian opinion, as I shall be serving a sentence of imprisonment. The hardships of jail life are mostly imaginary. Keep absolutely firm to the end. Suffering is our only remedy. Victory is certain. It would be another five years before Gandhi's campaign to end indentured labor would reach its climax. Five years of repeated beatings and imprisonments. But Gandhi did not persevere alone. His wife and children, including Uma's grandfather, aged just 18, served prison sentences by his side. So they said second cell? That one. That one. think of an 18-year-old boy who wants to go to London to study to be a lawyer and who ends up sitting in jail. But I mean he did it willingly and was happy to do it and he went again and over and over again. Yeah, I think it's just a shock to see the solitary cells. The history of the Gandhi family's struggle in South Africa is well documented. But in South America, David Dabberdeen has yet to find a single reference to his indentured great-grandfather. Coming from Calcutta, starting with the Lord Hungerford, uh -huh. 1845. Uh -huh. And here you have the index, ah. and you're looking for the Apolline. Apolline. Oh, you have Apolline. the Apolline here, because this paper's been around you since 1845. Say, you mean to say, when I turn the page in a minute, I'm going to find this old man? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Page 215. Uh -huh. Oh, dear. Yes. Name. He's out there, is he? How much is, what's his name here? This is a list of the, the Indians themselves in the ship. Yes. But he's not there, is he? Think we got yep. him? Yep. I think we have him. Ships from Calcutta. Aha. Now he must be here. No. Well, well, let's turn uh, let's to 1855. Let's go to the front. It's the yeah. index. Yeah, Apolline. The Apolline. Aha. Uh -huh. Fifty. Yeah, fifty. Uh -huh, look him. Look at him. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 we yeah. traced him, right? God, yeah. look at him. Yes, David. David Din. Well, tell me when he came. Fourteenth of June, eighteen fifty-five. Yes. So fourteenth of June. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you, nobody yeah. in my family has ever seen this, you know, mm. Evan. I'm grateful to you, right? His father's name father's here name. is P U R R O W T Y. T Y. Porot Porot. Uh, that's How was okay. that? Male. Male. Age that? 27. Oh, he was 27 when he yes. came. Well, he was 27 yes, years. Yes, he was 27. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, and here he died um, in oh, 1912. Dear. His his um, death uh, certificate number is 479 of 1912. When he died. So, like so what is that 479, 1912? That's um, the ID number. Yeah. So you'd have to go to the back and look for 479, 1912, and you'll find oh, so it. So 479, you'd find it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The person's the date of his death, you know? Because you always think you're going to find the old man, but you never really believe he died. Because he's been such a memory, such a kind of a, a legend and a rumor in our minds. You and until you see it says dead and very heavy, really sad, heavy, sad, dark writing. He ceases to be a legend and a rumor in your mind because he actually died in 1912. I never expected, this came as a shock to me, I never expected that I would also see his death. So that this has been very shocking, you know. And the bluntness of it, after all those years of pulley work, it just ends dead. 
479. Where did that number come from? Was he the 479th yes. Kuli to die? <laughs> For that particular period, probably. Really? Yes. Well, he chose an odd number. Huh? Oh, there he is. The year when of the Titanic. Was the Titanic go down in 1912? The Titanic went down in 1912. <laughs> so when the Titanic was going down in 1912, this little Kuli was also going down. <laughs> huh? While the Indian coolies continued to toil in the sugar plantations of South America and the West Indies, it was events on the other side of the world that would finally turn the tide against the whole system of indentured labor. News of Gandhi's campaign in South Africa had reached London, and the idea of an Indian uprising became a very real threat. The Indian problem was the obsession of one man, General Smuts, the Prime Minister of Natal. He demanded that his friends in Westminster rid Africa of what he called the Asiatic cancer that they had introduced. They began by enforcing an impossible tax on the Indians. I think the intention of the Natal government was to make the lives of the indentured workers hard. Um, if they were not going to pay this tax, then they would have to be perpetually indentured. If they were going to be free, um, they were never able to earn substantial amounts of money. It was an impossible tax, and it was meant to be an impossible tax. Gandhi didn't give up. He continued to hold protest meetings and invited Indian political leaders to come to South Africa and see how badly the empire treated its Indian citizens. In November 1913, Gandhi launched his biggest campaign to date. He began by addressing Natal's coal miners, persuading the indentured workers to come out in protest against the government. Soon over 15,000 indentured workers from the nearby sugar estates also joined the strike. 20,000 people responded to Gandhi's call. These are the only surviving photographs of that protest in 1913 and show Gandhi himself at the moment of his arrest. They also capture the birth of civil disobedience. Many of the protesters were brutally beaten and imprisoned by British officers, and Gandhi was sentenced to nine months in prison. Here was an Indian rising to prominence with a particular political message, directed ultimately, as we all know, at India itself, but speaking to the condition of Indians worldwide. And the condition worldwide was basically in indentured labor. And it's at that point, and the kind of upheavals which followed Gandhi's message, that leads imperial figures to speak out against indentured labor itself. Even from within the establishment, unlikely voices were moved to announce that indenture could not be allowed to continue. One was Lord Harding, the Viceroy of India. Indians in South Africa have violated these laws with full knowledge of the penalties involved. In all this, they have the sympathies of India, deep and burning. And not only of India, but of those who, like myself, have feelings of sympathy for the people of this country. Whitehall was outraged. Increasingly frantic internal communications warned that Gandhi's coolies were becoming martyrs. The cabinet discussed Harding's immediate recall, but didn't want to agitate an already delicate situation. Indentured emigration was suspended pending further investigation as Britain entered the First World War. Who in 1914 could say that this system makes any sense in the world of the 20th century? It's, it's as antediluvian as slavery had once become in a century earlier.
While Britain turned its attention to other more pressing matters, the man who had arrived in South Africa as a young middle-class lawyer was preparing to leave a completely changed man. With it all police, I was an insignificant fully lawyer. Take Gandhi, the lawyer, 1906, in a Western suit, and take Gandhi on the eve of his departure from South Africa, dressed in very Indian traditional dress, but very simple rustic dress. In his dress in 1914, when he's leaving, he's signaling his identification with an indentured working class, that this is the identity that he wishes to be associated with. This is a Gandhi who has managed to find a mass following. And the nut shell of what is Gandhiism is very much in shape in 1914. And it's in India that he then begins to apply whatever he has learned in South Africa to a bigger project, the freedom of India. The British scattered a million and a half Indian people to all corners of the globe with all kinds of consequences right down to the present day. If you consider many of the great political upheavals of the last 30 years in the old British Empire, the tensions in Fiji between Fijians and Indian peoples, the extraordinary expulsion by Amin of Asians from Uganda, the extraordinary demographic confusions of South Africa brought about by people settled there by the British. All of this a direct consequence of British imperial and economic policy in the world at large. The Indian coolies may have become a distant memory, but their legacy refuses to go away. Freed from indenture, they forged their own communities and abandoned colonies around the world, becoming lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs. In countries from the Caribbean to the South Pacific, Indians formed the majority of the population, and in some took political power but they have now become victims of their own success. What started as a peaceful prayer meeting in central Serba turned into violence with the arrival of about 100 angry Fijians. Armed um, soldiers and police stood by as the Fijians went on the rampage. From the relative safety of the Suva travel lodge, journalists watched as Fijians beat Indians. In 1987, ethnic violence and rioting in Fiji led to a series of coups which ousted the Indian-dominated government. Today, ten rebel soldiers stormed inside the parliament building and marched them all off at gunpoint. The Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Bavadra, along with the Deputy Prime Minister, one of 19 Indians dominating the government since last month's election in racially divided Fiji. Now, more than a century after they were first transported around the empire, the legacy of indentured labor has come back to haunt the Indians of Fiji. The new Fijian nationalist government is enforcing archaic British laws dating back to the period of indenture, laws which prohibit Indians from owning land. As land leases come up, they are not being renewed. Thousands are being displaced and impoverished. Stranded in refugee camps with no country willing to accept them, the cause of their plight, the British system of indentured labor, has been quietly forgotten by the rest of the world. If you look at all that and think of this as a kind of function of grand British imperial design, all designed for British betterment, for our well-being, but who so much knows about it now? Who so much thinks about it? There is an extraordinary uh, discrepancy between what the British did and what they remember they did. to ensure that the hardship that they have endured, the difficulties that they have encountered in the long and hard journey from India to the plantations and from plantations to now is remembered by posterity. 
Okay, boys and girls, I will read to you one poem which I learned in class three. Raat andheri, hawa sansani, paal phal phadate the upar, siriya aage badha chala tha, piji sagar ki chhati par, ta ek ka hua dhada ka, सीरिया टकरा चट्टानों से एक तरफ वो सीधे डूबा मची खुलाहल सब लोगों में डूब मरे मल्लाह यात्री समा गए सीरिया वाज द वर्स्ट डिजास्टर इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडियन इंडेंटेड एमिग्रेशन टू फिजी 57 पीपल डाइड at Nasilai. The image of wreck resonates with the experience of my people today. More than 120 years later, they feel that they're shipwrecked in this place. Syria reminds me of history repeating itself. I've devoted most of my adult life trying to understand the experience of Indian people in Fiji. It's very emotional because I'm not talking about a group of people in the abstract. I'm talking about people from whom I am descended. I found it haunting. The ghosts of the past haunting the place, reminding us of the sacrifices, the difficulties our people faced. <laughs> 